what I try to do at the end of this is take um, all the different points of view, side conversations, um, and, and find some synthesis and major themes that have gone on, um, why we've uh, discussed this. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit, so I don't forget, uh, addressing Joey's provocation after Joyce's question, which is um, around kind of mapping what's going on. And it's something that we've really looked at and tried to figure out. Um, is it a Salesforce solution, whatever? But um, we recently did conversations with uh, all of our active grantees and many of our active prototypes, our first class of prototype grants. And we're asking them, you know, what kinds of things can I do better? What do you need from us? But we heard over and over again that this type of thing, this type of convening, is vitally important to it. And we found that people were reticent to talk to each other if they hadn't physically met before. So once you find that, there's something here that's very special that we're very focused on and saying, how do we be very strategic about what these convenings are? How do we do signal to noise right? Um, when you have someone, when you meet someone, how the best thing to do is think about how uh, you can follow them, uh, how you can keep in touch with them, but we know that the physical connection for that is really important, and after that, it becomes easier to do that. Mapping the entire universe of what's going on is difficult, but I think if we get better at thinking about this through a convening, and what I heard from everyone that I talked to was that that was really important. So just a little bit of a, a, an answer to that and why this is so important are these ideas that we have. So um, this is one of the things that came um, out for me on this is... A lot of this stuff that we're talking about, there's a real disconnect, um, and um, it's something that uh, you may have heard, and it's something I have uh, said, which is to say that a lot of the conversation about the open web only occurs on Sand Hill Road and K Street, um, and usually oppositionally. So how do we move this? How do we make it something that you run into that you're per perhaps sick of seeing <laughs> um, as a meme, as a format? So I think one of the things to talk about that's a continuing conversation that came up um, increasingly in our thoughts during this conference was, why isn't this something that's more important to everyone? And we addressed it a little bit, and I'll go through some of those. Um, so first of all, being open might not be enough. Um, it might not be enough to pat ourselves on the back and say, wow, we're doing all this open stuff, and it's a great, and it is great. But increasingly, what we find, and what is, I think, a conversation here, is when you produce these things that are beneficial and positive for our culture, country, world, um, you're really at a brand warfare moment with the rest of content on the planet. So what used to be where you're, if you're developing a truth-telling app, um, that's a brand. You have to think of it as a brand, really, because what you're going up against is The Walking Dead and Game of Thrones. You're not going up against another truth-teller app. You're not going against another media site. It's the flow of information so high. How do we make these things? How do you get attention paid to them? So opening your, being open is key. It's vital as a cornerstone. But I think what we heard um, is how do we extend that? How do we push that? How do we make sure that once it's open and that it is open, how do we build community around that? Really important. This came up a lot. And what I mean by Think Water Not Plumbing is we tend to talk about the pipes. We tend to talk about the infrastructure. Um, the fight for us is um, often around making sure that these things are, and even the metaphors that we use tend to be around fast lane, slow lane, you know, these kind of systems idea. When really, what we heard over and over again is the thing that turns people is content, right? When, some, when I get eliminated from something, when I can't see something, when I want to do it, that's when I realize there's constrictions on what we're doing. So we have to, I think, shift the conversation to being a lot more about water and what type of water we have and why that water is important um, or perhaps beer, um, but not necessarily what the plumbing is uh, for it. And uh, that's going to be really important as we move forward in this tension around making these types of issues much more open. This, I think, came up a lot. I don't think we know who, we, we have some idea of who are important in these spaces and have been, but I think we have to make sure that we're finding new he heroes and celebrate them, large and small, technical, non-technical, um, uh, this morning around, we saw a lot of people like that in, with um, the examples in Turkey of people taking opportunities to, to uh, be, work in very heroic ways around journalism, openness, fairness, those types of things. Finding them, celebrating them, moving them to the forefront, I think is going to be really vital. Um, so a recurrent thing that's happened in this conference is the need to remember the human. Um, we just had a great example of that with human-centered design, a brief overview of, of that um, uh, in this last couple of hours. 
But the, there's a sense that there's all this machinery going on, and I think it was, especially with the city and the sensor moment, um, where you're losing the sense of what the human is and making sure the human is centered into this. So that as we talk about these issues, it's easy to forget that there's people behind it. Um, and that the, the notion that there's something behind there and that the technology is overriding uh, what it is uh, about humans, that humans are using that technology and that's what they're about, is I think really important to keep in mind. And so that they're not ghosts, they're actually humans, right? So there's actually something there that we need to pay attention to all the time. We need to be building for, we need to think about, we need to interact with, and it's not the tech or software itself. Um, I was really struck by this, uh, and again, this notion of how do we make all these principles more democratic? Uh, the notion of a grandmother in Turkey changing their DNS uh, is a great. Is great, and when, I, when we think about that, it's like how can we how can we make those types of skill sets ubiquitous? Um, how do we enable people to understand the internet in that way? Um, and thinking about that, that's so vital to do, and it's so important in their lives that they will figure out or look up or find someone else to help them do that. And we need a lot more. I think again on this notion of democratizing a lot of these issues across. So it's not just specialists, and it's not just people in this room that care about it, but actually people everywhere. Um, what came up a lot, I think weirdly, is that we need more policy people. Um, we don't have a lot of policy people actually even here. And these are issues that need people, we need to start interfacing with that. Just as a lot of what Knight has done and what we have tried to do with the MIT conference, is an interface technologists and developers with journalism, with information, and what those things are. And I think what we're increasingly running up against is the need to do that in governing bodies. Uh, we find we do a lot of open government work, or a little bit, we try to do open government work. Over and over again, it's the things that you heard uh, throughout the conference, that it's the leadership at the top that defines the time and space that allows those changes to occur. Um, and we need a lot more people in those. So those new heroes that we have, we have to find them, I think, and the wonks. So, uh, and so another aspect of what we have is how do we layer those people into government with these issues that we care about? How do we interface with those? How do we give them tools to do it? Um, it's amazing when we start getting into open government, people will say, um, um, you know, this is, uh, I, I don't know if it's legal for me to give you this spreadsheet. They have no idea. It's not that they don't want to. Um, they just don't have any aspects of it. And Jim Palka tells this great story from Code for America where she said, you know, I go into a city and I say, well, why don't we release this database? And they say, well, um, it's against the law. And she's like, okay, well, show me the law. And then they can't find the law. And they said, well, it's actually a policy. And she goes, okay, well, find me the policy, right? And they try to find the policy, um, and there is no policy. And he's like, well, there's probably a memo. And you go, okay, well, find me the memo, right? And then they get down, and it's like, Doug said, we're not supposed to do it, right? And then, like, <laughs> Doug hasn't worked there for five years, right? So, um, so we need to figure out how to get those people in um, and really work and help them get the strategies around that. So this is the coin I turned. Uh, a coin I turned, I turned a coin. Uh, <laughs> uh, which is getting at the tensions between what we talked about with the potential of what urban spaces is and what sensors and surveillance and that. So a combination of this very connected, complex thing that is utopia and panopticon at the same time. Right, so something, this notion that the sensor networks that we have could build brave new cities that are really exciting. At the same time, what does it mean for the individual? What does it mean for surveil surveillance? What does it mean for freedom? Um, and these are things that I think we really have, they're conjoined and weird, and we have to unpack it. And uh, not that I think this is going to enter the dictionary anytime soon, but the notion is how, how do we think about these things um, in really smart ways, and how do we pay attention to it? and not block the things that are going on. Um, so one final meme moment, which is to say, uh, this is something that, I, that has heard um, over and over again, and not that I want to leave on a pessimistic note, but um, because I think a lot of the conference has been optimistic around these things, but it's very real. Um, I think all of us since that at this 25 year turn um, of the internet anniversary, that uh, there's a real potential of losing many of the things that we've worked, a lot of us our whole lives, on building. And vigilance is key on this. And uh, I think if, if we're active in it, 
we can get through it, but being very aware of the Mark sermon note of saying, I think we're losing, um, is scary. Um, so these kind of convenings and having everyone interact is super important. And uh, these are the kinds of things that uh, if we have more of these and we stay in contact and we develop new ideas and we think refreshed and anew, um, we won't have to um, worry about this other than making sure that we're vigilant in what's going on. So um, Ethan did an amazing job of thanking everyone. Um, um, I would also like to thank you and a big thank you again to Lori and Ethan and Laird and Studio 125 for coming. Thank you all for coming here. Um, and just a final shout out, I have to say, uh, to Megan, if she would stand up a bit, because... Uh, and, and, the, and, the re, and the reason for that is Friday is actually Megan's last day at the Knight Foundation. So she's, <laughs> she's leaving for a terrific opportunity to a very great nonprofit as a project manager in Miami. But uh, we'll miss her desperately. I know you all will miss her desperately uh, when these things happen. She's just been an amazing person to work with. So just on that note, uh, good luck to Megan. Thanks to all of you, um, and we'll see you on the internet. Thanks.